couple of events took place that uh, made me think that it would be good to talk about uh, the purpose of a temple, why some of them are different, and what I mean by that is why the feeling that you have at the temple or the welcome you may get at the temple is different. Um, Temples are basically shrines, <clears throat> and um, the first thing that happens after the building is built is a shrine is usually built within it, and depending upon the tradition, the shrine can be relatively simple. It usually has a larger-than-life Buddha statue for the same reason that the Lincoln Memorial is very large, it gives you a, a feeling of grandeur. But it doesn't always have a larger than life, obviously, Buddha statue because our statues are not bigger than life. They're quite a bit smaller. And depending again on the tradition, it may become very elaborate with a number of different Buddhas depicted in disciples and arahats, which are enlightened beings, and it just goes on and on and on. And this establishes the character of the temple because Ultimately, it is a shrine. And for this reason, when we come into the temple, we take off our shoes because this is uh, a practice that was borrowed from the Hindus, but it's also practiced in other religious traditions. It's very common anytime you're on holy ground or special ground that you remove your shoes. And so we have this custom in Buddhism that when you enter the temple proper, you're removing your shoes. And that's because you're entering a shrine. And because it's a shrine, it, it tends to establish the way people are treated at the shrine because people are looked at ultimately as pilgrims. Now, you have to understand, if you went to an ethnic temple and you said to them what I just said, they would have no idea what you were talking about because we have 2,500 years of tradition. <clears throat> and sometimes we forget why we do things. And by the same token, uh, it is a, an appropriate... Uh, place to teach the Buddha Dharma. What better place than a shrine to the historical Buddha? So you find his disciples there. Uh, usually they're, they're ordained or clergy disciple, but they could still be lay disciple who have erected a shrine. And throughout the history of Buddhism, uh, we've been shrine builders. There's little doubt about this. You, you, uh, every two or three years you hear about um, some shrines that are now in lands that are completely controlled by another religion being destroyed. Um, but the shrines are very much, again, like the Lincoln Memorial or any other shrine you would build to a historical figure. And they become special just because of the remembrance of that, that historical figure. <clears throat> now in the Buddha's day, of course, there were no shrines. There were buildings after a while that were put up to protect his followers from the, the elements, the rain, which was the primary thing that they had to deal with. Uh, it's not like the great American desert where they also have to deal with a lot of wind and a lot of dust. For the most part, it was a rain. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a cold rain, it was a warm rain, but still, uh, it's a little distracting to be sitting in the rain for hours. Uh, it's hard to concentrate and it does eventually uh, take some energy from you. So they built buildings to congregate in. They, had, uh, they used those buildings very often to eat, but a common thing was to go and to hear the Buddha talk or to hear one of his senior disciples talk. And so this coming together for Dharma talks was uh, well established 2,500 years ago. When the Buddha passed away, he told his followers not to build shrines. And he said, if you want to remember me, then simply take my begging bowl and set it on a table, set it on some kind of raised portion, and then you can remember me. And um, this was practiced for quite a while. Of course, there was only one begging bowl for the Buddhists, and he had disciples all over northern India, so when they would come together and they wanted to remember the Buddha, they would have a raised spot, which he sat on, by the way, so that he could be seen and he could be heard. And so he was sitting on this 
raised area so he could be seen and he could be heard by everyone in the crowd because huge crowds formed around him. And so now you have the beginnings of this um, shrine, this particular kind of shrine we have, because they would still have this place in remembrance of him, and someone would place a bowl there, and that bowl started taking on some power all its own, you know, because in the beginning, one week it was probably Fred's bowl, and the next week it was Bob's bowl, and the next week it was Susan's bowl. And then somebody said, well, you know, if we're going to put a bowl up there representing the Buddha, it should be the best of bowls because that's the way we are as human beings. So it went from being anybody's bowl to being the best bowl they could find because there was always a monk in charge of these bowls. Bowls were very important because the monks at that time went into town and begged their meals. And so they all had to have a bowl and they would hold the bowl out and food would be put in it. So I'm sure they dug through the pile. I don't know this for a fact. I may be making all this up. But I'm sure they dug through the pile and they found the nicest bowl in there and they set it up there. And as time passed, somebody, some layman probably, with a little bit of money said, you know, that's not a bad looking bowl, but we could make a better one. And so he went to a great artist and he had a beautiful bowl made that represented the Buddha. And you can see where we're going with this. Sooner or later, we built a statue. The Indians were great statue builders. Even in the Buddhist time, their country was strewn with statues of various gods and demigods. So uh, the leap to that. Now the Buddhist concern was that he did not get deified. That's mainly why he said don't build a statue. He didn't want all of a sudden uh, to be turned into um, <clears throat> one of these sort of god mans type characters. He wanted everybody to remember that he was always a man. This is important to Buddhism, to remember that the Buddha was a man. Because everything he accomplished as a man becomes accessible to us. If we turn him into anything but a man, then we have a reason why it's not accessible to us. Because he was so very, very special, he was be able to see the true reality of life. He was able to stop suffering. He was able to control his emotions. But if he's a god, then of course we can't do these things because he was so very special. And the Buddha really was so very special because he was a man that did these things. And in turn, he turned around and he taught other people to do them. And he had many, many disciples that were enlightened, that were able to live what you would think of as the enlightened life, however you define that they were able to do that. So I think his biggest concern when he said, don't build a statue to me, is don't turn me into a god. And I always find it very interesting that the school, the, the elders, the Theravada, which means elders, the great elders, um, who accuse the other school, the other big school, the Bahayana that we belong to, they accuse us of deifying the Buddha. And yet, in their school, by the time a few hundred years had passed, it became a recognized idea that there could only be one Buddha in an age. And an age was defined as a memory. In other words, if you could remember the Buddha, you were in the age of that Buddha. When that Buddha was completely forgotten, the age was over. So we're talking about a really long amount of time. And they said, well, there can only be one Buddha in one age. And when the Buddha is completely forgotten, then along will come another Buddha. <clears throat> there's a lot of people on earth. If we're all going to be reborn and recycled and, and we wait in line for our turn to be Buddha, we're talking about some pretty huge numbers when it comes to time. The Mahayana went off and did some different things and recognized a whole variety of Buddhas that were historical and non-historical but always maintain that kernel of an idea, that very important thing that everybody can become awakened. And in my way of thinking, the historical Buddha became deified in, in the Theravadan path because he became so much bigger than life that it wasn't possible for anybody to approach. Well, that's what we do with uh, people that we think are bigger than life, that ap approach perfection. Uh, one of our ways of honoring them is to say, no, we could never be that good. And that's a great kind of humility. It, uh, you know, it's, it's not a bad thing, 
but unfortunately it can become a limiting thing. If we decide that someone is so much better than us that we can never be as good as them, then we stop trying. And it's all about effort. So I say this because as we went through time, you must remember that a temple is a shrine. But as temples, shrines were built in different places, and sometimes the shrines, you can go to Sri Lanka and look around and not really find what you would think is a temple. There'd be a huge shrine. And there might be some little stone building off to the side where the monks sleep. And there really is not what we would think of a temple. But there's a beautiful garden and there's trees and there's this great huge stone statue. Um, So it doesn't always have a roof. But it's a place of welcome. Because shrines are typically open to everyone. For the most part. I know there's religions in the world where... um, Shrines are kind of restricted, but for the most part, shrines are open to everyone. For the most part, people don't ask you, are you of the religion expressed by this shrine? The crowds are just allowed to go in. There is an assumption if they're coming there, they're coming there for good reason. And so it's it's kind of an open-ended, unlimited sort of approach. Well, while this is going on, a great heresy happens in China. And the great heresy became known as Chan. And in Japan, it's called Zen. It's the meditation school. And um, that can be misleading because almost all schools of Buddhism have some form of meditation in them. And most religions have some form of meditation. It may not be recognized by us as pure meditation. We might give it slightly different names, but they call it meditation. So there's this universal thread that runs through there. But generally speaking, everything is open, and then comes the heresy. And the, the cause of the great heresy is that by the time the thing we call Zen today, or Chan, or Tian, came along, people had centered their lives around these shrines. And the shrines became the total focus. And the practice of the Buddha Dharma had become a practice that, on one hand, was extremely devotional, as if every shrine that was built was a relic of the true Buddha. You know, in in, uh, Sri Lanka, they have the tooth of the Buddha, very important shrine, because this is a relic of the historical Buddha. Well, it was almost like, and in China, they have so many teeth that we could probably build an army with them. You know, they have fingers and toes and it's old-fashioned religion. They have all these relics. Makes me think of the Middle Ages with the, the bones of the, the disciples, you know. Put them all together and you've got a pretty big guy with a lot of arms and everything. Well, these shrines became very, very important. They became holy places. They became places that people went and prayed. They started to become what the Buddha didn't want them to be. And at the same time, there was a school that was spending a lot of time following the rules because the Buddha laid down a lot of different rules. And they came out as a lot of different rules. Actually, what he did is he just reacted to the moment as he walked through the villages and he was at the different encampments of his disciples. When someone would do something outrageous, he would turn and say, okay, from now on, we don't do that anymore. Well... He lived so many years that there was just a whole lot of, we don't do that anymore. And instead of people actually looking and seeing what he was talking about, well, we're not mean to other people. That's what we don't do that. And we take, we take care of other people and we, we have modesty. Instead of concentrating on that, they concentrated on each little utterance because they didn't want to, uh, they didn't really want to interpret the Buddha. They felt he was too special. So they just stuck to the letter of the law instead of the spirit of the law. So things are getting complicated. A couple days ago, I was, uh, didn't have to work Friday, which was really, really nice. Acquired a long weekend, so it was time to do some gardening and uh, <clears throat> other things around the house that have been put off. And obviously, we've arrived at summer. And... Uh, so I was working and sweating and uh, being a, 
a little bit more than mildly physically uncomfortable as the temperatures were going up into the 90s. And I looked down here and I saw a car. Not an unusual occurrence, but I'm not usually home during the day, during the week, to see cars arriving or leaving. And I didn't see this car arrive. But I was busy doing physical stuff and pretending that I wasn't hot. And so I came down here to see what was going on, because we do have visitors that show up sometimes. And they're used to the idea that the shrine is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that there will be living these nice, quiet, passive monks who will open the door for them and show them around out in the middle of the great Mojave Desert. So I came down and, and uh, here was a nicely kept older model car, windows down, parked over here, looked around, didn't see anybody. The reason I had noticed is I heard a couple of gunshots. That's what made me go out and look to see what was going on because I heard these couple of gunshots, and they were obviously gunshots. So I kind of looked out to see, because there have been times when people would, that rode across the street. One day I looked across there, and a bunch of people from the city came out, parked on that road, got out, unloaded all their rifles, and started shooting towards that mountain, as if nobody lived here. You know, so not realizing on the other side of the mountain there are a lot of houses and we have kids that climb rocks and this is not, you know, the great gun wilderness. And so when I hear gunshots, I usually investigate. Like with that time, I called up the sheriff and I said, we got some city guys and they think they're out in, in a safe place and they're not. Maybe you go tell them to move along. So I go back up and I... I see a fella climbing around in the rocks behind my house. So I walk out there and he kind of meanders back and forth and I see that he sees me and he's stopping and he's doing this and that and he's meandering. He has all the feel of a feeling of a waitress in a bad cafe. You know, the one when you want a second cup of coffee. Her eyes come across, and when they get to you, she looks at the ceiling and then comes back down again. And you know she knows you're there, but she doesn't want to take time to give you a cup of coffee. Well, that's the feeling I got from this young man. It was kind of like, well, I belong here, and it's okay for me to be here. And I remember having those kind of feelings when I was young, you know. And so I finally started walking a little bit towards him. Now, remember, I don't know if this guy's got a gun. I'm looking at his hands all the time. Because for all I know, you know, call me stupid, but he's got, he's got a pistol or something, and he's decided he can go up into the rocks and he can shoot this pistol. So I'm looking at his hands. I'm not really looking at his face because I, in one sense I don't want to antagonize him if he's some kind of crazy guy. And he's got a couple pieces of trash in his hand, I realize. But I see that he has something in his hand. So I go up and I ask him what he's doing. And he, gives, he starts in very defensively telling me about how he goes around cleaning the desert and, you know, taking care of Mother Earth and all of this. And, and I said, that's nice, but you're up, up behind somebody's house doing this. This is private property. Well, it's not posted. Not an interesting idea. You know, you, you see the big fences out here. People post no trespass. You know why they do that? They don't do it so much in, in California, but they do it in Texas for a reason, because they'll shoot you if you're on posted land. Isn't that great? So he kept telling me, well, there wasn't a fence. And I went, well, you know, most people up here have two, three, five acres. It costs kind of a lot of money to put a fence up around their land. And I didn't want to get into any kind of philosophical discussion about generally fences were put up to keep things in, not keep people out. You know, you have a fence in Texas because you have cattle. You don't have a fence because you don't want somebody to come on your land and start tearing things up. So I didn't want to get in a philosophical discussion with him. I just, you know, kind of wanted to point out to him that he was tromping around somebody's backyard. And this has happened a lot over the years. I can remember being woken up one morning when we used to live in that house, and our Dharma hall was the Zendo, 
with a bunch of motorcycles riding around the house, having a hilarious time. And I went out there in my bathrobe and told them to leave, and they wanted to become combative. It's really funny when people are doing things they shouldn't be doing, how they get upset when you point it out. So we had this encounter. Well, what made it interesting was is that he said to me, he says, I can't believe that I'm getting such an attitude from someone at a meditation center. And I thought, hmm, well, you've got to realize I deal with kids day after day, all week long. And uh, <clears throat> this is what it sounded like to me. And I said, well, be that as it may, you're trespassing on private property. You're behind somebody's house. I said, where do you live? And we live in Victorville. And I said, well, then you're not used to the country. I said, if you came home one night and somebody was in your backyard mucking about, wouldn't you be a little bit, just a little, well, depending on what they were doing. I said, I hardly think so. I think if somebody was mucking about in your backyard, you'd be a whole bit nervous. I said, it makes it worse out here because people come out and do crazy things. And then he pointed out that he had been to the center once. He didn't recognize me because I'm sopping wet with sweat, got a big straw hat on and a t-shirt and shorts, all covered with crud. He says, well, I came there and everything like that and everything. I said, okay. And I said, well, you know, if you'd been down around the center, I said, I went down there looking for you. I said, if you'd been around the center, that would be one thing. But he says, well, I went way around the back. And I thought, and he's easily in, in his mid-twenties or something. I pointed out to him, I said, well, you know, every square foot of this land out here belongs to somebody. Whether they put a fence on it or they put a house on it. See, we used to sponsor Boy Scout troop, and I had to tell these boys this. They'd go walking off across the desert for a little hike. I said, this land belongs to somebody. And, of course, I was trying to teach them to respect things, like you find the little abandoned shack. You don't start throwing rocks at the windows and tearing things up or uh, this kind of thing. Whether somebody's there to make you not uh, hurt their property or take their things. So we had this conversation, and he left. I walked him back down, and, and he left. Um, and I think he started to reflect on you know, this kind of defensive attitude he had. But he was using all kinds of interesting arguments about why it was okay because he walked way around and he was being careful of this and that. And, you know, who really owns land? It belong, you know, and I just, oh, I thought we're going to get a book on the American Indians now. And he, we're going to do everything here just not to be responsible for wandering around behind somebody's house. But anything like that that happens, I, uh, and he couldn't understand why I wasn't friendly. Now, I wasn't, you've got to understand, I wasn't throwing rocks and yelling and screaming at this guy because, first of all, he might have had a gun. <laughs> you know, so I know I wasn't that way. But by the same token, I wasn't going to go out and I, I went out like I would do in any situation, and I was assertive, and I said, what are you doing here? You're behind somebody's house. You're on private property. And he didn't like hearing any of that. Well, that made me think about the feeling of different temples. I haven't been to a lot of temples, and uh, like some people. Some people have been different temple every weekend. You know, if you live in Los Angeles, you could probably, probably go to a different temple every weekend all through the year because there are so many different temples down there. There are temples that essentially are just for the Orientals that attend the temple. And then there are, the, there are temples just for Americans, because you don't see many Orientals. Everything's in English. And then there's these kind of bridge temples where the Orientals decided they would invite the Occidentals, and so you see a lot of culture sharing. And you, you always know it, because there's, there's always a very nice person who will go around and explain to you how they do different things and why they do these different things and offer you lunch. Because most Buddhist temples on, on their regular gathering day, they always have lunch. 
See, the grandmas, I call them, the, the ants, they always come in and they make the lunch. They bring the food and they make a lunch and then at the end of the service there's this great lunch. I know because I get to eat a lot of those lunches, or I used to be able to. But these are all the grandmas. Everybody's grown at their home and, and they'll go and that's part of their devotion is to provide those lunches. And they take turns and sometimes they fight over who gets to do it which is always interesting when 80-year-old women are fighting over who gets to cook. But I thought about myself as he went off, because he, he started to tell me, well, I'll probably reflect on, you know, I'm a little combative and, and uh, it's a problem I have. And I go, I, don't, I didn't say, yeah, I wasn't sarcastic. I just went, hmm, yeah. And, uh, you know, as I'm driving home, I'll think about this. And he, good, good, I said. So off he went. But it did make me think about the atmosphere of different places. Some places are not particularly inviting. And some places are very, very inviting. And part of it has to do with culture. Part of it has to do with differences. And part of it has to do with the school that's there, what kind of school you have. If you look at the fact that the people that we call Buddhist do not proselytize, <clears throat> That's something that Westerners are not used to. In other words, they never ask you to become a Buddhist. They never, usually don't ask you to do anything. And even if you're friends with them, if they invite you to the temple, the only reason they will invite you to the temple is because there's a party. Okay, if they're doing what they should do. They won't say, why don't you come pray to Buddha with me? But they might say, you know, this is New Year's and we have a really big party and you might enjoy going and seeing it because the monks are going to do this stuff and the kids will do this stuff and we'll have this really great meal. And, and um, so it sounds very, very social and a misconception happens. In, uh, I've seen American monks, they don't understand what's going on. They say, well, it's all this social stuff. That's not real Buddhism. Uh, you know, but it, it's emphasized because we don't proselytize. And then we have the great heresy that took place in the uh, 8th century. And the great heresy was Zen. And in the process with Zen, uh, for a long time, the shrines got smaller. They never completely disappeared, but they got smaller. And the, the social aspect kind of disappeared a little bit. And quite honestly, they got a little, uh, a little lackadaisical about the rules. And it didn't look like Buddhism to a lot of people because there wasn't a big shrine of the Buddha. And they weren't having the big party. And so people were kind of going, what's going on here? Well, what was going on was a whole lot of meditation. And meditation's hard work. Half an hour of meditation's not hard work, but half a day of meditation's hard work. And when you have half a month of meditation... We definitely know that hard work has arrived. So that we, we get the story of Bodhidharma's successor coming to his mountain temple and trying to get in to study with Bodhidharma. This is a guy that's already a monk. He's got monk's robes on. So he's standing at the gates of a temple and they won't let him in. Well, part of the reason they wouldn't let him in is because China in those days, out in the mountains, there were wild bands of bandits. And the Chinese bandits were pretty nasty. It didn't bother him at all to kill everybody as they robbed him. No witnesses, you know. Just kind of, in, of course, they, they had this terror. I'm sure that part of it was that people would be so afraid when they saw these bandits that they'd just give them everything they had. So here this guy is standing at the gate trying to get in, trying to get in, trying to get in. Stands there for days in the snow and finally cuts his arm off to show his sincerity. What an extremely violent act. It's so violent that nowadays people change the story. I've even done it myself. Well, maybe he didn't do that. I read one account where he broke his arm getting in the gate. I always felt that was probably just trying to soften that story. Such an extreme violence to oneself. And then went stood by Bodhidharma. Now think about this, amputee standing by Bodhidharma. Either this guy was a total maniac, 
or things were exaggerated, but who knows? Because like I said, these Chinese bandits, we know without a doubt that they would go in and they'd kill half the people in a village. They just cut their head off. So he goes in there and Bodhidharma won't even pay attention to him. And that's the gist of the story. Finally, they have an encounter where he has an awakening. And now he is allowed in. But for a long time he stands there trying to convince Bodhidharma that there's even a reason why Bodhidharma should talk to him. The meditation school, the school that everything is centered around meditation, is at times a very harsh school. And it's a harsh school because a lot of people play games with themselves. And the silliest thing in the world to say is, we don't need to do it that way because we're modern. We don't have to follow the rules because we're better. We don't have to do this. See, I've lived all my life hearing this. I've heard Americans say, we don't need to do that because we're Americans. We don't need to follow that rule because we know better. We don't have to watch our actions and our speech and our mind because, hey, those people have problems. We don't have them. All you have to do is read the newspaper, watch the television. We are not any better 2,500 years later than the people that sat around the Buddha. We don't have any more control over our emotions. We don't have any more control over our violence than people had back then. <clears throat> this revolutionary school that started in China, part of, part of what was going on was a recognition that a lot of people just mess around. They don't take the practice seriously. Now, we're not talking about a fanatical practice. We're talking about doing a lot of meditation and being responsible for yourself. And to be responsible for yourself is to be very, very honest about what's going on. That honesty may be that you have to be honest that while you're supposed to be meditating, you're sleeping. While you're supposed to be meditating, you're daydreaming. It may be something that simple, that straightforward, something that probably nobody else knows except you, but the practice is for you. You're doing this practice for yourself. You're not doing it for anybody else. When I meet someone that said, and we, a few years ago, we had, oh, any number of people training here to become priests or monks, nuns. And uh, some of those went on and, and they are in other places and they're doing the work and they're teaching people to meditate and they're teaching people the Dharma. And some of those people decided, well, it just wasn't for them. This wasn't what they want to do. And that's perfectly fine. But a very important aspect of this is this honesty. And meditation requires an enormous amount of honesty if you're going to make any progress. And what I mean by progress is if you're going to move towards being enlightened and being happy in life. Because enlightenment is being happy in life. That's what it is. Enlightenment is not being able to, with your mind, lift a building and move it from one spot to another or kill a bird on the wing by looking at it and putting a hex on it. Enlightenment is knowing your true nature and by knowing your true nature, you know the true nature of all things. Enlightenment is dead simple. But it's extremely hard because we play games with ourselves all the time. We make excuses with ourselves all the time. And you know that. Because anytime you say, yes, but, you're making an excuse. Anytime you have to justify why you did something, and everybody does it. You know, and we think, well, we had perfectly good cause to become angry. We had perfectly good cause to say the things we said. We had perfectly good cause because this other person or persons did these things. So it's a yes, but. Zen came along and said, we're not even going to play this game. And the Chinese, and I kind of told that story to give you a feeling, Chinese are not touchy-feely people. 
Indians are touchy-feely people. The Buddha was a touchy-feely person. Chinese were, were not. They didn't worry about your self-image. They didn't pat you on the shoulder so you'd feel better about yourself. And so now you've got the toughest of the tough, and they're running these temples, and these temples aren't even really functioning as a shrine anymore. And they build them on the side of mountains where you can, you know, you have to travel for days, sometimes weeks, to get to them. They made them as inaccessible as possible because they didn't want any tourists. Because everybody in this temple is working really hard at being honest with themselves and really hard at getting to know themselves. And they just didn't want to fool around with tourists. So almost all the Zen temples were built on the side of mountains out in the middle of nowhere where it wasn't comfortable to get there. It was a hardship. And they figured the tourists will stay in the cities or they'll stay in the provinces close to the cities and they can go visit the shrines and be devotional. And of course, Zen very much was a heresy in that time because it went against everything that the Chinese considered Buddhist. So sometimes when you go to a center, the center doesn't seem so friendly. And that used to bother me. Because I'd go there and i think, well, they're not, they're not as friendly as the other place. And we have to be careful about when we judge. But I'd like to think that sometimes they're not as friendly as the other place because they're very busy trying to be honest and trying to work hard on the self. And sometimes they get a little bit impatient with tourists. Now, we try to be really friendly here. Don't get me wrong. But I had to think about that when he said, well, I can't believe that someone from a meditation center would be combative as I'm checking his hands for a gun, you know. And I told him that. I said, I heard gunshots. And I started looking around. 